Cool. Great. For our next section, we have Nathan Tablunthus with misclassification causes bias in regression models. How to fix it using the misclassification models. I uh, forgot to change the title for the to match things. Um, sorry uh, about that. But anyway, yeah. So I retitled this. Uh, and I'm new. I'm Nathan Blenais. Uh, I'm excited to be here and to talk to you about um, work I've been doing with my collaborators, Valerie Hayes and Chung Han Chen. Um, and it's about how uh, misclassification and automated content analysis, which is a kind of study design that we're that we're talking about, um, how it causes bias in regression or other kinds of downstream statistical analyses. But it's actually a fixable problem. Uh, and uh, even though a lot of people uh, don't seem to understand that yet, we're trying to help them. Okay, so about me, um, I'm a computational social scientist, and most of my research is sort of in this interdisciplinary space between social science and technology design. I study how people organize online to produce public goods like Wikipedia and open source software, or do collective action like in social movements, um, and about how technology does or doesn't support them. Uh, I'm currently a postdoc at the School of Information at Michigan. Uh, before that, I was a postdoc at Northwestern. Uh, and I did my PhD in communication at the University of Washington, and I'm actually still mainly based in Seattle, and so that's why I'm here, um, and I'm excited to talk to you. Um, happy to be here. Okay, um, yeah, so this is a project that comes out of this paper that's in the archive now. It's still under review, but you can read it there if you're interested, and I'll, there's a link at the end, um, but I'm just kind of like advertising the paper there. Um, so what am I here to talk about? So there's a study design uh, that we call ultimate automated content analysis, and uh, it's that's what we call it in you know our local field, but uh, a lot of other people do similar things where you take some training data that maybe was expensive to acquire, you use it to train a model, and then you take a larger data set that's maybe cheaper to acquire, and then you predict that data set using your models, and then you take those predictions and you feed those into a regression model. Um, but there's a problem, which is that your machine learning classifier isn't perfect. It has uh, makes misclassifications and its errors. Uh, and when you feed those errors into your downstream analysis, that causes bias. Uh, and actually that bias is can be a pretty like nefarious form of bias. Um, and this is also rarely acknowledged. What is more commonly acknowledged is that there's a sort of, you know, bad vibes that come from having a model that doesn't have a very good precision or recall or F1 score. And so if you're not uh, if your model is not really good, then people aren't going to trust your analysis. But if your model is really good, then people will. Um, but I argue that you can actually do a lot better than that, um, sort of just hoping that the model is good enough that it's reliable based on those metrics. You can actually um, use the validation data, which you were already using to compute those very statistics, like precision and recall. Um, but if you model that data jointly with the predictions, you can then correct the bias and get back out consistent estimates. Um, and I'm going to show... Uh, the only method that works well for this, um, whether the errors are random or non-random, and whether um, you're studying a dependent variable or independent variable, the only one in work that I've found in the social sciences to date. Um, and so what's wrong, uh, put like briefly and formally, we want to estimate a model uh, that has a variable X in it, but we don't use X, instead we use W. And W is either X, if the classifier is right, or it's not X, if the classifier is wrong. And it's important to point out this is like the binary case because that's what makes it easy to solve. If you were trying to work with continuous variables, uh, now you have to deal with some numerical integration techniques and it could be a mess. Um, but if you're in the, this nice case where you're working with binary variable, it's not too hard. Okay, so I'm gonna show that this is a problem using a real data example uh, that comes from the civil comments data set. This is 448,000 comments that were uh, annotated by humans. And uh, the humans said, okay, this comment is toxic. Um, whatever that's supposed to mean. Uh, and then more concretely, whether it discloses identity, this might be someone's like race or ethnicity. Um, we also are using in this example, uh, the number of times the comment was liked. Um, and we ran this human annotated data set through a very widely used API, the Jigsaw Perspective API. Um, Jigsaw is a company that's part of Google. Uh, and actually the civil comments data set, it's part of the data that's used to build this API. And this API does very well at uh, predicting this, uh, this toxicity label in this data set of the next growth. Uh, 0.79. Um, and so we can test what happens when we use logistic regression models with these variables uh, with toxicity either predicted by perspective or annotated. And this is what we get. And um, so here's results. Uh, and so on the top, we, are, we have the outcome as this racial or ethnic identity disclosure. And when we use the automatic classifications, um, we don't observe uh, direct uh, statistically significant 
uh, coefficient for likes onto automatic classifications, but you do observe that when you have manual annotations. So in this case, we have a type two error. Uh, an analyst might reach a conclusion that there was no relationship when they would have found one if they'd used the higher quality data. Uh, and in the second example, if we have toxicity as the outcome. I'm just kind of showing that the problem affects both cases in the where toxicity is the outcome or the uh, predictor. In this case, we got a type one error, automatic classifications. You would have, have would have you believe that there was a negative relationship. Uh, manual annotations would have you believe that there was no relationship and the direct effect. And then I have the interaction term in there and stuff like that. Uh, it's kind of a toy example um, to get like small effect sizes where like you would have this kind of problem in a really large data set with a pretty accurate classifier. But this is not too unusual. People do this kind of thing all the time with these interaction terms. Okay. Oh my goodness. I just accidentally skipped way ahead. Okay. I accidentally hit the scroll button. Okay. I actually skipped all the way into my uh, backup <laughs> slides. So where am I? Okay. Uh, okay. Sorry about that, everyone. Okay, now I'm back into the main slides. <laughs> okay, um, so now I'm gonna show you the R package. So the point of that example was to show you that the transparency of this classification is not enough. This is a classifier which is used in tons of studies uh, and it has an F1 score that meets the normal standards that people hold these kinds of models to in these kinds of studies. Uh, and this being transparent is not an assurance that you don't have a type one error or type two error because you have these automated classification or these misclassifications. So the question now is, can we fix it? Um, and I say we can fix it. And I'm going to show you first how to do it using the package that we're developing. And then I'm going to show about, talk a little bit about how it works and show how that works in some simulations. Um, but so this is the R conference. So uh, I'm going to talk about the R first. Um, so we have this package, uh, we call it misclassification models. The API um, has two functions. One's called GLM underscore fix it. And then there's another one, which is for the DD, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, and it's follows a pretty standard like GLM type of interface. There's two things that are special. Um, one thing that's special is that you have this double pipe operator. Um, and we use this to mean that in this case, like the toxicity coded is the ground truth. That's your validation data. And it's predicted by toxicity pred. And then you pass two data sets in. One is the data with the predictions one was, and one is the validation data. And then the other thing which is special is that you have like actually a bunch of extra formulas here and extra families. And these are for the model that will do the error correction. Uh, in this case, uh, I'm using a model that has just the, um, we're, but, but the proxy formula is basically you wanna predict the predictions as a function of the ground truth uh, and any other variables that might be correlated with, um, and I'll explain more, basically any other variables that are required to make the uh, outcome conditionally independent of the predictions. Um, if you don't know what that means, don't worry about that. I'll explain a little bit more about that later, but if some of this is going over your head, I'm happy to talk with you afterwards. Um, I have a bunch more information prepared. Um, okay, but so here's what the results we get when we do this um, with uh, toxicity as the outcome. Uh, basically, so we had, so this was using a small sample of annotations, um, not that small, 10,000, which is actually a lot smaller than like 500,000. But uh, so in that case, you have, too much uncertainty to rule out the, uh, really to tell the difference between the truth or what we would get if you just use the automatic classifications um, or whether you on the, uh, just use the manual annotations. But when we do the error correction model, um, we get something which has um, more, uh, you know, it's more precise than if we had just used that sample and we get close to the right answer. Um, whereas if we use the automatic classifications, we don't get the right answer. And then, um, to show you the dependent variable case, it's very similar. Uh, and, um, oh, actually, I forgot to change something. The side is actually has an error in it. There shouldn't be this truth formula here. I, was, I meant to show you that, like, in the DB case, you don't need the truth formula. Um, and I'll explain why in a minute. But first, I'll just skip ahead to show you that, in this case, it also works. Um, and we have more precision than if we had just used a sample. But we get an answer, which is uh, the same as what we would get if we had used the manual annotations. Okay. So now I'm going to sort of transition into sort of talking at a high level about how this works. Um, and I'm going to use some notation. It should be pretty uh, intuitive. Y is a dependent variable. X is an outcome. Or sorry, X is, a depend X is an independent variable. Uh, and then W are the automatic classifications of either X or Y, depending on which case we're looking at. Um, and then it matters to talk about other observable variables, which I'm using Z. And this is because we're doing multiple regression. and um, 
basically you want to make sure you might be actually using you know predictions just as a control variable and you might really care about estimating beta z um, or maybe you care about estimating both beta z and beta x but because you're in multiple regression if z and x are correlated uh, the misclassification errors in x can affect your estimates for beta z uh, and then i'm going to show you some um, in some plots i'm going to use this graphical um this this gray circle to show you that uh where that that's the variable that we're measuring with the classifier okay um so this idea comes from biostats uh it's at, there's a textbook that i'm citing here um that i found the answer for but biostats literature it's usually actually working on much harder problems than this problem because this problem is pretty easy um and i'll tell you why in a minute um the overall intuitive idea is that we're going to use the manual annotations validation data and we're going to model the automatic classifications as you already saw um, and this requires specifying two or three models we have the main model of scientific interest we have a proxy model um, which i'm calling that here and so in the literature it's also called the error model and this um, models the automatic classifications as a function of everything else and there's the truth model sometimes called the exposure model uh, and this models the annotations um, and you can just use the intercept only model for this in practice or you can get some additional statistical power to use other variables um, and the overall idea is that you jointly estimate these models using maximum likelihood and you might notice that well we have a lot of automatic classifications we have a small number of ground truth um, so what we're going to do when we don't observe the ground truth is we're just going to integrate it out meaning we're just going to provisionally assume that that variable has each of its possible values um, and it actually is totally no problem um, for the maximum likelihood uh, anyway uh, okay I have a lot more info about how that works in the backup slides. Um, in our paper, we compared our method that we pulled out of the biostats literature to some other methods that some social scientists working on the same problem have been talking about regression calibration, um, which we're calling GMM because that's how they use that's their estimation technique. Regression calibration is a pretty broad family of techniques. Multiple imputation, um, which tries to basically predict the missing values um, in one step and then does an analysis in the second step instead of what we're doing, which is both correction and estimation in one step and then there's pseudo likelihood which is a similar idea to what we're doing but it doesn't um actually use the validation data to do the modeling it just uses the precision to recall um anyway um so this is the slide about uh what i was talking about earlier about conditional independence so um these are bayesian networks uh two nodes are connected if there's a correlation between them that can't be accounted for by another variable um and we can say basically on this side um this right hand or for me it's the right hand side for you it's a little or yeah the left hand side has the easy case where there's basically any relationship between either the in the id case between the predictions and the outcome can be accounted for by x um but in the harder case there's a relationship that you can't account for and you need to put um y in the proxy model uh in that case and so um in our Oh man, okay, sorry. Uh, in our, so I'm gonna show you simulations right now in the last two minutes um, that use that case. Um, and I'm gonna skip this slide, it's obvious. Um, <laughs> so the simulations have uh, low medium, uh, actually classified about 72% accuracy, pretty large effect sizes um, for, for drama uh, and a relatively large data set and about 200 labels of validation data, which is something that's you know pretty attainable if you're like, using humans to label text or images for you. Um, and so basically we can see that our method um, gets back out, in this case, the, this is the IV case, uh, pretty similar estimates to what you get with just manual annotations and the multiple imputation idea also works, um, though our method's a little bit more efficient. But the two other methods that people in our world have been proposing didn't really work in this case because they weren't designed for differential error um, or the, anyway. Um, and then in the DV case, we found that our method worked and then the other methods didn't work. Um, but you can see again, in this, in this scenario, the automatic classifications can be like really misleading. Um, and our method was the only one that was consistent. Okay, so my main conclusion is that yes, we can fix it. Um, and uh, there are some limitations. The main thing is that your model needs to be like correct. You need to have a the correct model of the data generating process. This is a pretty standard kind of statistical assumption. Uh, now you might be pretty worried about it, um, because you might have like missing variables in like if you're using the perspective api you might really be worried about it because you can't access the features the perspective api is using right but if you're training your own model or you're using an open source model now you might be able to you know you don't, you're not going to be missing any information that needs to be in that proxy model 
um, you might still have to, you know, do some, uh, you know, careful studying and modeling in order to, you know, specify that model correctly. Um, if there's interaction terms, nonlinearities, that sort of thing. Um, and then it's also important to point out that we're assuming that the validation data is error free, but the human annotators might also make errors. Uh, and there's actually some literature in the biostats world for things like, okay, what if you have two different medical tests uh, that make different kinds of errors? Can you use those to get back out a better prevalence estimate? And so you might be able to work with those ideas together with these ideas and uh, account for both kinds of error at the same time. All right, that's um, that's that talk. And um, so these are some QR codes that'll link you to the package or to the paper. And then my website is simple enough. You should be able to uh, check it out yourself. Um, thank you very much. How to do you here?